Welcome, Ian, to church this morning. I hope you are all well. Uh, we are gonna begin our worship with a song that I found last week, and it has really helped me as I started in person, um, finally at my internship, and it has just been very busy and crazy and just stressful. And I know um, a lot of you are also stressed right now. Uh, this song has brought me peace, and it reminded me um, to find peace in things around me, but ultimately to realize that God is that peace that I am finding. So I hope this brings peace to you this morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church today. Uh, hopefully you guys are all doing well. I wish I could see you this morning, but I can't. So I'm just hoping that everything's going well and you guys are enjoying life and, and being back in school this past week. 
Um, as you can see, I'm not in my normal spot <laughs> preaching this morning. Um, so I apologize in advance if there's any noise. I have the two dogs kind of walking around. Uh, so if you hear them playing in the background <laughs> or growling or whatever, um, try to ignore them, okay? Hopefully they don't interrupt us. Um, but as we begin this morning, we're not actually doing anything new. We're not having a new series or anything. I'm just going to be preaching from one passage this morning. Um, but before we do that, I just want to invite you. Let's let's just bow our heads. Let's invite God into the spaces that we're in. And let's open our hearts to him so that he can speak into our lives. So I invite you. Let's close our eyes and let's let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just uh, come before you this morning. And we just want to say, God, we invite your presence. We invite you to speak into our lives as we listen to your word. And I just pray that um, some of us maybe have come off some pretty hectic weeks, crazy weeks. Um, maybe it was a not so great week, but maybe it was a great week. Um, but God, we recognize that we need you all the time, even in good seasons, especially in bad seasons. And so uh, we just come to you this morning. We ask that you would speak life into our um, into our lives and that you would just speak truth and that you would um, just help us see things from your perspective. Um, so, Lord, we just lift this all up to you. We ask that you speak to us this morning. We pray this in Jesus name. Amen. All right, so this morning's message comes from the passage, Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. And I've, I've called this sermon, Come As You Are. I don't know if you guys are, are too young to remember there's a song called Come As You Are. Um, so that's where I get the title from. But I think it's an appropriate title for this passage. And uh, I want to start by asking you guys, um, has anyone else ever had company coming over and you you had to clean up your house or your parents got you to clean up your house and there was just like a crazy cleaning spree going on before company came over? I know it was a long time ago because of COVID, um, but I remember when I was a kid, my mom would like almost turn into a different person when we had people coming over. Like she went from being really kind and gentle to like almost a military general, like, hey, we got to do this. We got to do that. We got to clean this. And she get us all running around like chickens with our heads cut off. Um, and I was one of those kids who, you know, I didn't like, I, I'm still like this. Uh, I didn't like cleaning things. So I would just sweep things under the rug. If I had toys or things lying around, I would just stuff them in my closet. I'm sure a lot of you guys do that too. So I didn't actually properly clean anything. Just out of sight, out of mind. That's That was my motto. Um and to this day, I think it's it's kind of silly the extent that people go to clean for people coming over to their house. Like it, it, it's almost like we want to make our homes or our rooms or whatever look like nobody lives in them. Like when I go over to someone's house, you know, I expect to see dishes in the sink. I expect to see like, because people are living in the house, right? So you expect to see these things. We almost clean up our houses to make it look like nobody lives there when company comes over, which I think is is kind of funny. Um, in a way, though, it's it's almost dishonest, right? You're kind of pretending. You're pretending your house always looks like this when it doesn't really. Um, when it comes to doing that, when it comes to like sweeping dirt under the rug, I think we do that in our own personal lives as well. What I mean by that is no one wants to show their true colors because we always live in fear about what others might think. And so... A lot of us, or most of us, wear kind of a mask to hide who we really are and the things we struggle with. And the result is the world is just full of fakes and phonies, right? We just pretend like we're good and, and when we're not really. Um, we also pretend to be people that we're not, right? We compare, we get jealous, we're constantly chasing after what others have or do or say, um, social media is like the biggest culprit in this. I don't know if you know this, but social media, when you have your page on Instagram or Facebook, you're basically advertising yourself, right? You're basically advertising yourself the way you want other people to see you, even if that's not actually how your life is. And researchers say that this is kind of a phenomenon that affects youth more than anyone else. And I think that's, that's true. 
because when we're young and I'm, I'm not as young as a lot of you, but we're all still pretty young. <laughs> when we're young, we're trying to form our identity. We're trying to figure out who we are and we're constantly desiring to be somebody else because of social media. Um, and so we're living in this hostile world and we're scared of what others think. And so we feel as though we have to wear a mask or pretend to be somebody that we're not. And, and the worst part is sometimes our masks are so realistic that we not only trick others into thinking that that's who we are, but we also somehow convince ourselves too. And we convince ourselves that that's who we are. And too many people then start living this kind of phony life pretending and they don't actually know who they really are. So what does this all mean? And, and why, why am I talking about it this morning? Why is it a problem? Well, first, it means that we don't want to be vulnerable. Okay, we fear what others think of us. So we don't want to be vulnerable. Second, it means we, we aren't being honest with ourselves or others about who we actually are and the things we struggle with. And three, we end up closing off our true selves and living our entire lives under this mask. So today, we're going to look at how Jesus wants us even with our mess. He wants us even with our mess. How if he came over to your house, he'd rather you not try to clean up and make it look like nobody lives there and, and pretend, you know. Uh, he, wants to, he wants you for who you really are. He wants the real you and the real me. He doesn't want the fake and the phony. And so before we read our passage um, this morning, which is a great passage, I want to give us some background information so we can understand um, where Jesus is coming from and what's going on. So this is at the very start of Jesus' ministry, and it's considered the best example of what kind of God we worship. It really shows us the character of Jesus, but not only the character of Jesus, because he was also God, also the character of God. And so we're going to read this, and I invite you to open your Bibles. I don't have a PowerPoint this morning, so you either just have to listen to me, or you can open your Bibles and follow along. I'm in the New Living Translation this morning, so reading from a different translation. But the passage is Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. So I'm going to read it for you guys. It says, One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went over to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. And then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping, and her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. And then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. But then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. And then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? And then Simon answered, well, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. And then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven, and so she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. And then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Amen. So let's, let's recap the story a little bit. Okay. So we have this Pharisee who invites Jesus over after the synagogue service. 
Uh, he's interested in what Jesus has to teach, but he still questions who Jesus is. Um, and then we have this immoral woman who comes into the scene. And the language used here to describe this immoral woman is she's probably a prostitute. That's kind of the, the way that it's written. And it would be really, it would be considered really inappropriate for her, especially as a prostitute, to interrupt this conversation going on between the Pharisee and Jesus. Um, be very, very inappropriate for someone to interrupt. And not only does she do that, not only does she interrupt, but she also approaches Jesus and she touches him and starts to pour perfume and kiss his feet and cry. And the Pharisee, Simon, he's disgusted by the woman. He's like, she's a sinner. How can you let her do this? And because Jesus doesn't get upset, Simon starts questioning if Jesus is really a prophet, because if he was a prophet, like Simon says, then he would know that this woman shouldn't be touching him. But Jesus flips the narrative and he kind of goes against Simon here. And Jesus points out to Simon that the woman is acting this way because she's grateful for Jesus, who has come to take away the sin of the world, the sins of the world. The woman, despite acting out of you know, societal norms of the time is showing faithfulness and love to Jesus. And so Jesus also points out to Simon that Simon has failed to give Jesus the everyday normal courtesies that you would give a simple guest, whereas this woman has shown him incredible love. The passage ends with kind of a lesson for Simon, but also for us as well. And the lesson is that those whose many sins are forgiven are the ones who love Jesus the most. Whereas those who assume they're righteous will not have love for Jesus because they're unaware of their own sin. So what does this all mean for us? Well, I like to summarize it as Jesus invites you and me to come as we are. Because Jesus is not like the world. And he wants us without our masks. He wants us for who we really are. And what we see in this passage is that Jesus wants us to come to him like the woman that is vulnerable, honest, and open. So let's look at those three things. First, let's look at vulnerable. So coming to Jesus vulnerable. See, deep down, we want to be able to be vulnerable and open about our struggles and our imperfections. But fear gets in the way. Fear gets in the way and we worry about what others will think and whether they'll see us as weak or, or anyway, so we, so we save our vulnerability for those closest to us, like our spouses, our family members, our closest friends. But recently there's this phenomenon going on on YouTube. I don't know if you've seen this. The site has a bunch of vloggers, right? Those who take videos of their daily lives and record it on YouTube. And they've all gained really faithful fans, like a great a following, right? And, and they're almost viewed as celebrities. And they're almost seen as perfect in the eyes of the fans. I don't know if you guys have any YouTubers that you follow, but that's kind of how they are. They become celebrities and kind of look at their lives. Oh, they're so perfect. They're so great. However, in this last year or so, uh, there's been this fad going on where these vloggers, these YouTubers, try to post videos showing their fans that they don't live perfect lives like people think. And so these YouTubers have started making videos called, I have to admit something. I don't know if you've seen that title. Um, these are videos where they just admit to all sorts of things that they struggle with, like anxiety, maybe depression, suicidal thoughts family difficulties, all sorts of things. Now, at the start, these YouTube celebrities admit that they were kind of fearful about putting this on the internet and sharing this because they were scared of what other people might think. But, you know, instead of people coming after them or, or criticizing or judging them, it was really phenomenal because a lot of these YouTubers found that their fans suddenly formed a deeper bond with them. Because the vloggers went from being perfect to actually being real people they could relate to. Um, and that was really incredible for these YouTubers to find out. And so in our passage, we see almost a similar thing. The woman approaches Jesus with all of her brokenness exposed. She even lets her hair down, which was considered scandalous. And she was most likely afraid of what Jesus and others, especially the Pharisee Simon, might think. But Jesus responds to her vulnerability with compassion and understanding. 
In the woman's actions, we see that she's not trying to hide her brokenness. She has it all out on the table before Jesus, saying, I'm a sinner and I'm in need of help. She's not hiding anything. And Jesus appreciates this because she's coming to him as a person rather than someone who's pretending to be perfect. So in our own vulnerability, we open ourselves to receive Jesus' compassion and strength. Even Paul himself was vulnerable. Talking about Jesus, he wrote, but God has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I, Paul, will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. And that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So that's vulnerability. Now, Jesus also wants us to come to him honest, honest about who we are. My uh, old professor, he once told me this story, which I want to share with you guys. He said that when he was a kid, he lived at the bottom of this large hill. And in the summer, when they received heavy rains, the kids in the neighborhood would all go outside and jump in these massive puddles that they that always formed at the bottom. And the kids loved doing this because with the puddles, there was also mud. And so the kids had a blast just getting covered in mud, splashing around. Now, when all the kids were going outside to play, my professor's dad would always tell him, don't go jump in the puddles and get your clothes dirty. Don't go there. Don't do that. And he'd always listen to his dad except for one time that his friends convinced him to join in the fun. And my professor ended up jumping in the mud and not only did he jump, but he also fell into it as well. And at the end he was covered in mud from head to toe. And so he tells a story. He says later that evening when it was time to go home for supper, he was so afraid of what his dad was going to say or do. And he knew he was going to get in a lot of trouble um, because he had disobeyed his parents and he couldn't hide it either because he was covered in mud, like his dad was going to see him. And so my professor took his time going home at night and he started to cry because he was so afraid to face his dad. The guilt and shame overwhelmed him. And when he got to his house, he walked up to the door and he walked in through the front door and with a trail of muddy footprints on the sidewalk and mud dripping on the floor from his head to his boots. And there was his dad waiting, looking disappointed. And so my professor prepared for the worst. He was like, here it comes. I'm going to get in trouble. But instead, to his surprise, his dad came over, took his coat off, carried the professor. He's a kid, right? To the bathroom. Once there, he undressed him, filled the bath with hot water and bubbles. He then picked up a sponge and washed all the mud off of him. And my professor looked up at his dad confused. But all he could see was a little bit of a disappointment but a whole lot of love and compassion. See, in our passage, the woman comes to Jesus covered in mud, honest and transparent, wanting to be washed and cleansed. She doesn't hide anything. The sin is there. It's like having mud all over you. You can't hide that, right? She couldn't hide her sin from Jesus. Yet he tells her that she is forgiven because of her faith. And she just falls over and cries because she's so overwhelmed by his love. Now, I want you to compare that to the Pharisee, Simon. You know, Simon and all the Pharisees were known for walking around with false self-righteousness, right? They're wearing masks, pretending to be perfect, ignoring the fact that they too are covered in mud. And Jesus can see that because he's God. You know, they can't hide it. And so the question is, well, who are they kidding? Why do they think they're so perfect, right? Even scripture tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so to pretend otherwise is to be a liar, not just lying to other people, but lying to yourself and lying to God. And so people who assume that they're righteous will never experience much love for Jesus because they're unaware of their own sin and the mud that is all over them. So Jesus wants us to come to him honestly. So we talked about vulnerability now, honestly. And he wants us to come to him in need of cleansing, of a bubble bath. 
you know, my professor had a choice to try and clean himself up and lie to his dad and say, oh, nothing happened, but he knew he couldn't get away with it. And so the question is for us, we might be able to trick the world into thinking we're someone other than who we are, but do we really think we can trick God? All we can say is honestly, Jesus, I am a sinner and I am in need of grace. Now, the third one I want to talk about is being open. See, what we see in our passage is that true love, true friendship and relationships requires that we be vulnerable and honest about who we really are. And our relationship with God is no exception. The more open we are, the deeper the connection we have to others. So if we want to be close to, with God, then we have to also be open with him, letting him into every part of our hearts, our minds, and our souls, opening ourselves to listen, to obey, and to love him. See, did Simon the Pharisee open himself to Jesus? Obviously, he didn't. In fact, he was on the lookout to discredit Jesus as a prophet, and little did he know that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. But the woman, compared to the Pharisee, the woman, she opened herself fully to Christ. Even at the expense of looking like a fool or being embarrassed, even at the expense of her sins being publicized and her actions being considered scandalous, she opened herself, even if it meant spilling everything out on the floor at the feet of Jesus. So as we close this morning, In a world obsessed with wearing masks, and I'm not talking about COVID masks, right? Talking about masks where we pretend to be other people than other than who we really are. Jesus invites us, invites you to come to him as you are. He wants us to come to him vulnerable with all our brokenness on display without fear. He wants us to come to him honest about who we are as sinners and not pretending to have it all together. And he wants us to come to him open with our hearts and minds and souls ready to receive Christ and his compassionate love and forgiveness. And so when we come to Jesus like this, we are repenting. And when we receive his forgiveness, our hearts experience a deep and overwhelming gratefulness and love for him in return. John the Baptist, and I'll finish with this, John the Baptist urges us in scripture to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. What the woman did in this passage isn't something that Christ wants to happen just once and that's it. We may come to Jesus when we first become a believer, but scripture tells us to continue to have a repentant heart and to seek Christ's mercy and grace in every single day of our lives. And so Jesus says, come over and over and over to us. And the more we repent, the more we weep at Jesus' feet, the more forgiveness that we experience and the more we can praise and love Jesus because of what he has done for us. So let me leave you with this. There's no room for shame or guilt when you approach the cross. There's only gratitude and love. Jesus says to be like the woman and not like the Pharisee. He wants us to be vulnerable, honest, and open. And so my encouragement to you this morning is don't sweep who you really are under the rug before Jesus comes over for dinner. Be who you are. Approach him openly and honestly because he wants you and you alone. Let's pray. Dear God, we live in a world that tells us how to live, how to dress, how to act, and who to be. And so we spend our lives chasing after an identity other than our own. And we're afraid to be ourselves. So much so that we all have a mask that we hide under. When it comes to our relationship with you, Lord Jesus, we see now that you want us to come to you just as we are. You don't want us to pretend to be perfect or have it all together. You'd rather have us with our mess than with us sweeping it all under the And so help us to come with a repentant heart to you, Jesus. Help us to be vulnerable, knowing you are a God of compassion. Help us 
to be honest, knowing we are all but sinners in need of grace. And finally, help us to be open to receive your love and forgiveness this morning. When we receive this beautiful gift because of what you have done for us on the cross, we have no other response than to be overwhelmed by love and gratitude. And so help us to be grateful like the woman in our passage today and use our love for you to motivate us to better serve, worship, and trust you. Lord, we want to pray all of this in your magnificent name. We give it all over to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Call me free.